amazing. I haven't done anything yet. Um, uh, good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Marks. I'm a recovering journalist, having escaped from traditional media in 2003. And what I do now is I explore emerging platforms and how that affects storytelling. Uh, you didn't come to see me, you came to see these guys. And um, to, so today's my pleasure to moderate a conversation which has been billed as a discussion between European uh, political bloggers, to what extent they can create a real public discussion. But I'm going to start with the audience, because we want to make this interactive. Uh, so I will be leaping up and down on the stage. So sorry to the people on, on watching us on the internet. Uh, can we have a show of hands of who is actively writing a blog in the audience? OK, that's interesting. And um, so uh, who calls themselves a writer or a blogger? Could you raise your hand? Uh, do we have any politicians in the audience? How many people regard themselves as European first and uh, their nationality is second? They think European. That's interesting. Do we have any lawyers in the audience? No, good. That's, that's very good news. That's very good news. OK, well, we have four guests with me. Let me introduce them in alphabetical order uh, with what they say about themselves actually on social media sites. So I will start with uh, Rick Falkvinger, currently lives in Stockholm, Sweden, and is the founder of the First Pirate Party. He's a political evangelist, traveling around Europe and the world to talk and write about ideas of a sensible information policy. He has a tech entrepreneur background, loves cooking and whiskey, I understand. We're asking about your favorite brands. Um, Christian Muir. He's a journalist, human rights professional, and international media, uh, media policy expert. Last month, he was appointed the executive director of Reporters Without Borders German section. Um, and amongst other things, many, many other things, Professor Alexandra Pogliani teaches and supervises research on collaborative innovation and digital marketing at the University of Rome. She's had a connection with EU, EU projects for more than 16 years, currently involved with discussions about the European digital agenda. And last but not least, John Worth is founding partner of Tech Politics, a web campaigning and social media agency based in London that has run online campaigns for well-known uh, UK politicians such as Harriet Harman, Diane Abbott, Diane Abbott, I should say, and Ken Livingston. Sorry? Not for current mayor elections, OK. Hear that. Uh, let's start with Rick. Uh, what would you like to say? I'd like to sing a song. <laughs> now, Siri, what strikes me in terms of the public sphere here in Europe is that we have language barriers to cross, and they are a real problem. Are you, while I was leading the Swedish Pirate Party, I was blogging exclusively in Swedish, since, after all, I was talking to Swedish voters and Swedish citizens. But I'm sorry? Yes, I am Swedish. I'm Swedish. I live in Stockholm, Sweden. But once I started blogging in English instead, I multiplied my audience by so much and realized that had been a real language barrier here. Everything we'd said in the Swedish discourse on um, information policy basically had to be repeated in English because it just had not permeated the language barrier. It doesn't. So I'm currently working on overcoming these language barriers. I have a number of volunteer translators on my blog, so I'm trying to bring it multi, multilingual. And seeing just how that spreads the ideas that you actively have to build a European community, a European multilingual community that respects and acknowledges these language barriers. Otherwise, you'll get stuck in a specific area. You won't reach, say, German mainstream if you're blogging in English. You won't reach Italian mainstream if you're blogging in, in English, or, or French for that matter. And this is something that we need to be keenly aware of in terms of building a European public sphere. Can, can, can 
I'm convinced technology can help us. First of all, we have an, the ability to recruit volunteers to help translate articles, ideas, comments, which we wouldn't have had if we didn't have this technology. As in, we, we can have volunteers in each native language translating things that are interesting as we go. I'd be very interesting to see, for example, what, what's going on in Portugal or Albania or Moldavia, but I ha honestly, I don't have a clue because there is no input from those countries in a language comprehensible to me, and I think that's a real problem. Also, you have automatic translations that are sort of helpful to get the gist of things, and it's getting there, but I think it still has some way to go before you can really start discussing ideas in detail. And, and is there a danger of misinterpretation of ideas? Because uh, you may understand the text, but you don't understand how it was said. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they say all politics is local in terms of all culture is local, and things are always understood in the local context. So that, that's why you probably need a native translator that, who is able to translate not just the meaning of the words, but also put it in the cultural context of the recipient crowd. And this, in my experience, is much, much more important than you first realize. Okay. Alexandra, um, why do you think it's important that we should build a European, pan-European identity? Oh, Who cares? Well, I think I care, first of all. Uh, okay. And I think, uh, well, we've seen all the hands uh, holding up before, so I think there's many people that actually uh, uh, cares. And I think the economic crisis we are witnessing uh, is saying very clearly that a currency without a state doesn't work. And there is no state without an entity, and we can't really think about having superimposed a state over us without building from bottom up a sort of identity and, and common sense and shared opinion and a public sphere uh, from the people that lives in this continent. Uh, and I appreciate what Rick has said. Language has been a barrier for a long time, and traditional media up to now uh, have helped uh, forming national identities, especially in countries like Germany or Italy, where I come from, uh, that are younger than other older countries. Uh, but uh, they've made so through a common language and the portray of uh, shared identity and common custom that have helped people recognizing each other as a country. Uh, what I believe and what I hope for, and I think it's proving so, is that um, the development of new technology and their uh, inherent international and transnational uh, um, status. Uh, we are all uh, very aware when we go to the net or if we tweet or if we are on Facebook or if we write our blog that it's an international uh, sort of shop window. We know that when we're there uh, everybody can watch us, everybody can read us, uh, not only people from our country. And in Europe uh, I've seen that uh, in like analyzing what happened, uh, for example, when the Greek parliament was voting on the European Union measures. A lot of young Europeans, and not only young, but uh, even mainstream Europeans, have uh, used the net to understand what was actually going on, what people in Greece were thinking about. And even though the language was very different, a lot of people that were posting, they were trying to make it in English or in French, to have other European people understanding and sharing their point of view and sharing their situation, because it is a situation that uh, influences our lives too, not just them. But were they doing that because they hoped that the media would pick up on, on what they were tweeting or what they were saying on their blog or that other... Well, other Europeans. It's, it's like the egg and the hen, is it? Uh, it okay. is true in a way that uh, traditional media and television and broadcasting are bouncing back a lot of stuff that they, keep, they take, they pick up from uh, new media and social media. Uh, but I'm not sure and I don't think that people that share information on social media 
or on their blogs only do that uh, to be bounced back by uh, traditional media. I think it's traditional media who are following and chasing new media and not the way out, and not, and not the other way around. Okay, Christian, um, what challenges do you think we face in creating a European citizenship? Well, I would say sitting here talking in English again, I think we are already um, facing a very crucial question of European public sphere, as I think Europe is firstly not just about talking about European Union, that's very important for me, and it's uh, important, uh, Europe for me is, deals with multilingualism. In the last four years, actually, I dealt, dealt, uh, dealt a lot with a question and the challenge of multilingualism because I was responsible for a project which aims to establish something like a European public sphere called Eurotopics.net, it's a European press review. And um, I think European public sphere is still um, still something very, very elitist and I think that's actually the biggest challenge. And it's not, it's elitist firstly because of the language, it's firstly elitist because of the cultures and that really brings me right across to, to the day which is really important for my organization which I'm working today for Reporters Without Borders, the World Press Freedom Day because for me um, Europe and European public sphere is not only um, a question of language as a sense of Spanish, German, French, but really in the sense of political culture. And in Europe, we so far don't have a common political culture and a journalistic culture. And uh, that's as a first remark on this. And probably you know, one last sentence on this. What's really important for me, um, I'm speaking for reporters without borders here, is that it's always asking for press freedom in other countries, and we have problems in, in Europe, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Hungary with press freedom. What we really need is a common demand for democracy and press freedom, um, and this is a ground and a basis for European public sphere for me. But where will that demand come from, the public? Yes, from the public. That's a question of citizenship, education, a question of political culture. It should come from the public, and it comes. But I think from time to time, we aren't really aware that we in Europe could be happy that we have <coughs> something like a well-established democracy, even if it's not everything is good. But talking to Bay about on the word press freedom day about press freedom, we have lots of problems in lots of regions of the world. But it's a, uh, here in Europe, we don't know how lucky we are. Is that what you mean? Well, Here in Europe, we, we don't know how lucky we are compared yes, to living definitely. in Belarus, for instance. Definitely. Definitely is one of the worst countries. Okay. John, um, I know you've been on long train rides recently. <laughs> what would you, uh, that gives you time to think. Uh, and you're also a very active blogger. So um, why are you so passionate about Europe? Um, okay, just a word as well. That I'm the only one of the four speakers here speaking in their mother tongue. Um, I do speak French and German and bits of other languages as well, so I'm jo not just a monolingual British person, um, uh, just to make that clear yeah. um, at They're the horrible. beginning. Um, I think that the, the, the issue for me is most important, and also coming from a country which has a complicated relationship with the European Union, is that our identities are a multi-level thing. Uh, we feel some affiliation to our, our, our city, our region, our, our, our country, um, uh, to Europe as well. Um, for me, whenever I'm traveling outside of Europe, that makes me feel more strongly European than perhaps when I'm, uh, when I'm inside it. So that's worth, uh, that's worth being clear about. Um, I think those things change as well, and I do think our, our, our press and media have a slightly outdated concept of uh, those different levels of identity, and that different people can feel those sorts of uh, feel those those issues in a in a slightly different way. Um, I don't see the language problem um, in quite such a severe way as uh, some of the, the other remarks which have, uh, which have been made. Um, I see that particularly when it comes to creating a common European political culture, the difficulty is, is that we see the same problems through different national prisms still, regardless of language. So just to give an example, there was a very complicated negotiation going on yesterday in Brussels. I was blogging about this this morning. The Ecofin Council. If you read Spiegel Online or you 
read the Daily Telegraph reporting on exactly the same thing, and I can, and I can read German and read English, so therefore can, can follow both of what they're, they're writing. They view exactly the same problem, but in completely different terms. Um, and you can't actually tell from either of their reports what actually happened and why the negotiations broke down. Um, so it's not actually purely a linguistic issue. It's those are, those are traditional media which are appealing to national audiences, because that's where the business is in order to manage to sell the newspapers. Try to take that at European level, and that's where I'm kind of, um, I still have kind of one foot in Brussels, although I live in uh, London these days. Um, the difficulty is, in my experience, is trying to cover European Union to, uh, politics from a Europe-wide perspective is no one is actually currently very interested. If you look at the total number of readers of either blogs about European Union matters or indeed the kind of fledgling EU press, the total reader numbers are very, very low. Because do you, the do you have any numbers? numbers? Are very, be, sorry? Do you have any numbers? Well, my, my blog on a good day might get a 1,000 individual visitors. You know, the, biggest, the biggest EU online news sites like euractive.com or EU Observer might be getting something in the region of 10 times that number, no? but put that in context of what Spiegel Online or BBC News or something like that would be getting, and those numbers are still tiny. No? So that, that is a difficulty also because as a result of the people caring about those issues being so few, that means you don't have enough finances in order to do traditional investigative journalism, if you, if you like. Right. So therefore, to give the answer to that question which I posed about what happened yesterday. So I think there's, there is a business and a kind of political culture issue which is at least as important at Brussels EU level, at least as important as uh, the linguistic issue. Uh, you also run a, this European portal. Yeah, this is uh, bloggingportal.eu. Um, uh, uh, Ronnie Pat, who's here in the front, uh, is also one of the people who, who runs it. Um, we are a team of uh, about 15 to 20 volunteers who run an EU blogging aggregator called bloggingportal.eu. Um, we're basically blog nerds who read blogs about European Union business on an, on an everyday basis anyway. We automatically aggregate the content of more than 900 blogs, and then we have an editorial team that flags up what's good onto the home page. The only things we don't include are blogs which basically think the whole European Union is a conspiracy theory. Other than that, we, we, we'll, we'll include it. Okay. Um, it's had some reasonable success in and around the Brussels environment uh, of kind of taking blogs to a, to a wider audience. Um, I've been blogging about European Union matters now for almost seven years. And at the beginning, I'd say to people in and around uh, EU politics, I write a blog, and they look at me as if that was something from some other planet. I don't get that reaction any longer. And bloggingportal.eu has been one of those reasons for blogging being taken more seriously in and around the EU institutions. So if you write about any EU topic widely and generally, have a look at bloggingportal.eu and there's a button where you can submit your blog into the aggregator um, and then if you're producing good and interesting and compelling content, we, one of our vo vo volunteers uh, may end up flagging you onto the home page and that might drive some traffic your way. Can you actually make a career though? Uh, uh, no. Uh, no, um, no that, that's, that's important. Uh, well, we've, we've wondered for bloggingportal.eu whether we ought to make it into a not-for-profit association, try and apply for some funding or something for it. And in the end, we decided that it was more hassle than it was worth. So we're kind of an org we're building like an organization without a formal, a formal organizational structure. That means trying to take any decisions about what to do is a bit hard. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we managed to get something to carry on. I'm not aware of anyone who just purely out of blogging and sale of that content makes a business out of blogging about European Union politics. In some national political environments, there are people that do. In British politics, there are a few. Right. Um, uh, but doing that at European Union level, due to that lower number of readers, uh, you'd really be struggling to do that. Yeah, you, I mean, you, won't, you won't get advertising uh, if you're only reaching, let's say, 10,000 people a day. Exactly. Uh, Rick, uh, I'm interested, if you go to your website, you have a very interesting story about uh, why you believe that um, um, uh, people who make uh, culture, um, you have an uh, interesting fact, there will always be culture, whether, yes. whether it's funded or, or not. Will there always be uh, reliable journalism? Has there ever been? Okay. <laughs> As in, I mean, if you look at how journalism is changing, right? Oops. Right. 
Okay, nothing, har nothing harmed. If you, look at, if you look at how journalism is changing right now, you have old media, meaning newspapers, television, radio, and so on, who have always just claimed things and expected to be believed on their merits alone, on their credibility alone. But this is, this is cracking, right? There, there are cracks in this mirror. If you look at Wikipedia, you can see citation needed pretty much everywhere. People demand to go to the source, and old media does not provide this, but blogs do. And everywhere, People are demanding to at least be able to, to verify claims for themselves. So I think credibility is starting to be backed up by saying, this is where I got that data, rather than trust me because I'm honest Bob's car salesman or something like that. There's also a problem, too, that when you're talking about access to the source, that some governments are now trying to put uh, legislation to block certain sites. Which is a huge problem. I mean, they, they are basically not understanding that the legislators, usually in their 50s and 60s, who are creating these kinds of laws, who are setting the tone in their respective parties, do not understand that the wiretapping and censorship laws they are enacting are the equivalent of when they were young, if they would be putting microphones under every cafe table for the young generation. If they understood that, they, they would be absolutely horrified but they don't live the connected lifestyle, so they don't. And in terms of just going on, uh, just going on a question that I want to ask here in the context, overall context, uh, since we're talking about a, a European citizenship here, how many in here have heard recent news from Slovenia? Let's see a show of hands. One. Moldavia? One. Okay, Portugal, five. My Spain. point here is that yeah. how can you feel like a citizen of this area, which after all includes these regions, if you can't feel connected to them, if you've never heard of them, never been there, you never heard a single news of, okay, it's a, it's a spawn on the map, and that's it. I'm arguing that we need to actively work to include people across cultural barriers, across language barriers, or it won't happen. We need to see those white spots on the map and actively include them, or we won't get a citizenship including those cultures. But isn't there a problem that people, uh, let's say in Northern Europe, don't really care about the issues going on in the South and vice versa? Well, would that? I'd say most people up in North care about Greece right now. Yes, true. Okay. The thing is, they care about Greece, but they can't actually. Well, if, what if can Greece, they do? Well, what can they do? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Or in Slovenia, or take your pick. Yeah? The Irish are voting later this month on whether they ratify the latest EU treaty or not. Yeah? It will have some implications for all of us in the European Union altogether. What? What can I, as a non-Irish citizen, do about that? What can I do about wh whatever the outcome of the Greek election is going to be coming up this weekend? Now, I'm fascinated, and I will read all of that stuff, but I have no way means of influencing that process. Well, that was true until just a couple of years ago. I mean, today I'm connected to people all over Europe. People I call my friends are pretty much in every country, and that wasn't the case before especially Twitter hit. Yeah, but, but, but there's a structural problem in terms of the way our politics functions in that... Um, it's a Europe-wide problem of what to do with the Eurozone, but it's being played out in national political arenas to a greater extent, or intergovernmentally in Brussels. Um, when it comes to the 2014 European elections, there's nothing, whichever way you may vote, one way or another, as a citizen, of all, if we're all in this together, to be able to shake that out of the ballot box just in the moment. So there's a structural political problem as well as there's that networking problem, because equally, I, I'm fascinated, but I can't shape the Greek debate, and nor should I be able to, whereas I should be able to shape a debate at European level, but the, the political structures are not in place adequately yet in order to be able to do so. Uh, are there questions from the audience? If there are, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, uh, carry on. Uh, I'll... So uh, I just want to refer what John said. I think it's not just a matter of discourse, but, uh, yep. but a matter of the terms of reference of national politics, for, talking, for example, of politics of pension. I think everyone here is affected of pension because we someday we, we will be old. And so everyone is interested in earning at least some money when he's old. And I think, I think so to one hand, it's 
a matter of discourse, but on the other hand, it's really a matter of, of, of terms of reference and that the terms of reference of the politics which affect the people are mainly national. Um, I just wanted to add something to what Rika said. Um, and I agree very much with, with John. It's really a matter of the political structure that enables or, or doesn't enable us to, to uh, have a say. But I would also like to say that what you said is true, but if we take the US, I, I'm sure that most people in Dallas wouldn't know much about people in Boston or what's happening over there. And they don't actually care because they know they are part of, of a country which is bigger than their local community. And, and as a continent, we are plenty of local community in regions, in country, in a larger continent. So I'm not too much preoccupied about the fact that I'm not very much aware of what's happening in Slovenia just today. I'm worried that because what happens there affects my life too, or, or their economic situation, or their political, I mean, what's happening in Hungary, in Hungary, is, is um, influencing us too, in terms of um, freedom of press, for example. But we don't have any channel to influence what they're doing, although what they're doing is influencing us. So that's, I think, what is most important. Um, hi, uh, my name is Janet. I write for Global Voices, and we've been trying to translate our coverage between um, southern European countries. So a little bit like um, um, Alessandra was talking about people wanting to hear from each other. Um, my question is maybe, so it seems like there's the hub and, and a, or the hub and spoke and kind of a model of, okay, c discussions can happen in Brussels um, that affect all of the EU and people don't seem to be too interested in that. That's what John was saying. But people do seem to be interested in what's happening on the wheel, in other words, what's happening, um, but as, as you said, between countries. Um, and I actually think in the States, people in Oakland, for example, yesterday were quite interested in what was happening in New York, on May Day, what was happening in New York. And, just so you know, to know, like to note that European Revolution, which is this site on group on Facebook, has like 200,000 um, people on it, and they're quite active. So it seems like there's interest in certain like horizontal political exchange, but like there's a disconnect between that and um, Brussels. So how do we? I guess my question is, how do we <laughs> work from the hor the interest that comes up horizontally, and how does that get? back to Brussels. I don't think it's going to happen the other way around, but I'm just curious to hear your reaction. Okay, so with the risk of going into politics for a while here, uh, don't worry about it. I'll come to religion later. Then we are observing that the connected lifestyle is doing politics in a completely different way than the previous generations. We're observing that we are demanding access to people in a, in a way that our parents would think was disrespectful of, say, the prime minister or ministers or whomever, whereas us living the connected lifestyle just assume that we could tweet the prime minister and expect a response from her or him personally. And that's something entirely new. So yes, I agree that there is a huge aris political aristocracy problem in Brussels, if you like. There mostly living in an ivory tower, quite disconnected from um, the citizenry, the voting citizenry, and that's unfortunately a design of the European Union that the European Commission is completely unaccountable to voters. They will never have to face a voter for re-election ever again in their lives. So they're working with something on the order of tens of thousands of people to write policy, and they're completely unaccountable. The next generation of politicians, however, meaning the next generation of citizens, do not stand for this. They are demanding to be taken seriously in ways our parents weren't. And I think that this is a tremendously positive development because at the end of the day, that means that this Brussels ivory tower cannot survive. And I think that will mean that, I think that means that we will have access on a daily basis to not just our representatives, but to the actual people writing policy as well in ways that is unthinkable today. And do you think that blogging is more uh, influential 
in that conversation than, let's say, the mainstream media? Absolutely. I mean, blog, bloggers in the European Union are the ones, both in terms of inside parliament and outside parliament, are the ones who highlight what issues are important right now as they see it, but often this resonates with feelings of the citizens of Europe. ACTA would be the prime example right now in the, in the public discourse. We have a handful of bloggers, maybe two dozen key bloggers in total, that highlight what's going on with the negotiations in the European Parliament. And this results in hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in pretty much every major city across Europe. So there's a very, very powerful resonance here from blogging as a phenomenon to pierce this ivory tower and force transparency on the political structures that I think is tremendously important for the future. No. Question? I'm not sure it was from I mean, uh, Cheers. Yeah, but that's a topical thing. I mean, that's, that's what we had earlier when, when uh, Ronnie did the talk about uh, your uh, political blocks in, in Europe. Um, this is about net politics. This is about, it, it's, there's, there's a natural match between the people uh, on the streets and the people online. This is, uh, try that with agriculture and politics and, and it won't work. So I'm, I'm not so sure about this being a sustainable model for all policy areas. Uh, it will work in this particular area because it's the people who are affected, and it's not their fathers, you know, and maybe now because they own an iPad, but um, it, it's not our parents who are respectful of the Prime Minister, it's us who are affected by net politics. So yes, in this area, it works that way, but not about the Ecofin Council, not about uh, economic policies, not about common agricultural politics. It doesn't work for everything, and that is the problem, I think, uh, with respect to this approach. Um, that you just mentioned. I'll give a 30 second response before handing over the mic here. I think that five or ten years from today you won't be able to say net policy is a separate topic. I'd say that it will be something that permeates all our lives, all aspects of our lives, pretty much like you couldn't have oxygen policy as a separate topic. It's just going to be so everywhere that I don't think you can, you can um, skim it off. So, so access, you mean a access to the, the web as a human right, basically? Yeah, access to the politicians is going to be so universal. That's uh, long term, I think. Question. I really would underline what, what you said there in the audience. To, coming back again, what I said earlier, talking about social security politics, for example. I don't see so far any real European movement who, who fights against social security budget cuts. And that's, I think, due to the technology, because talking about the ACTA thing, I think that's as you mentioned, it's really a natural thing. But I think, I, I don't see any real European movement, transnational, um, in a similar way like the anti-ACTA movement. Well, there is, there is one example um, on phishing, you know, on mobilization on the web, which is Hugh's fish fight run by a UK chef. You know? um, now, it might be a bit UK focused with not so many signatures elsewhere online, but it's managed to get 750,000 signatures in an online petition about phishing discards. You know? Now, it's not social security policy, but it's not just a pure matter of net politics either. Um, what I would say, though, in, uh, quickly in response to Rick, is, um, and I say this as a kind of a, as a long-time member of the Labour Party in the UK, for me, uh, I don't see that change coming within Labour, unfortunately, and I think the same can be said for any kind of traditional political party. Now, the overall base of support may be narrowing, the numbers of, of, of um, activists may be narrowing, yeah? but the change of generation is not creating in terms of a new generation of politicians who are more better web, web activists. And Why in, is that? Because they are brought, born and brought up in a risk-averse, hierarchical political party environment. Net or not, yeah, they're, just, they're used to having friends who put inappropriate things on Facebook, and they're paranoid the same thing's going to happen to them. Yeah? So um, it, it can go a little bit both ways. Now, now, Rick may legitimately argue that in the end there may not be potentially a role for those kind of parties in the future. Uh, but nevertheless, when you've still got the hierarchical structures within political parties, both nationally and applying at European Union level, I don't see that change coming very quickly. I wish it would, but I don't see that change coming out of my UK and European Union political experience. 
Well, um, can I just add yeah, something? Uh, uh, I would argue that uh, any change uh, needs uh, a transition. And, uh, and just to uh, go back to the state, say in the UK, uh, I was amazed uh, a couple of weeks ago in The Economist uh, about them talking uh, about the third industrial revolution, talking about the digital. Uh, now, in terms of politics and the influence that blog bloggers, the net, people that have uh, more, uh, more free access to uh, communication channels, even with politicians, uh, it takes a while because, uh, I mean, if you were a politician that w was used to be in the ivory tower in Brussels, you, it would take a while before you would think that you need to answer. That's, you know, that's just about human beings are. So uh, b human beings are usually conservative, especially when they have, you know, when they are on the soft spot. I mean, that it's, it's just normal that they don't want to give a quick answer or a quick feedback. But the fact that it's now possible, the fact that uh, through means of technology, through means of uh, more exchange, I mean, the Erasmus uh, program has done so much for Europe to have more exchange of information among younger Europeans. All that has created an environment in which a more uh, closer relationship with our representatives and uh, and, and, and the pressure from the opinion, from, from the public opinion, is made more possible, which does not mean is there yet, but means that we can make it. And, and, and just another little thing, um, we often speak about these sort of issues uh, not realizing that it's also up to us. Uh, if we want to change things, it, it also is it's down to us. So I don't, I mean, as, as, Europe, as, as European bureaucrats, uh, you know, they feel better not talking with bloggers. Uh, probably bloggers feel more confident and are in the comfort zone when they speak about technology policies or the ACTA rather than fisheries or agriculture. It's just normal. But once you have uh, sort of gone um, go uh, over that, that point that, for example, you've made such a huge pressure for the ACTA, then you, can, you start realizing, well, perhaps we can do that for social security too. And perhaps somebody starts doing that. You know, it's always uh, down to someone who, who takes the uh, testimony and, and run. Otherwise, it will not happen. Or taking it from online to offline, to yeah. the streets. To the streets. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, disagree with John. My name is Justus Röhmert. I'm from the German Pirate Party. As a German and as a member of the Pirate Party, maybe I'm, my point of view is a bit off, but at least in Germany, you have a lot of politicians now that are acting with like, like bloggers, like netizens in a way, and not only people that did that all the time because they are from my generation, like Jan Philipp Albrecht and the MEP, but also people that are in traditional parties like... Uh, Peter Altmaier, for example, and that's not also on, on your German thing. Also, Donald Tusk went on IRC for like hours and talked to people in Poland. And Marietje Schrake, who is also who's from the Netherlands and also an MEP, also talks a lot on Twitter and so on. And um, maybe British politics is just more conservative than, than other part of politician, uh, other politics in Europe. Uh, just one question. When, when you say that people are on Twitter and they're having a conversation, are they having a, a real conversation or are they simply broadcasting, yeah. using Twitter as a broadcast platform? Some politicians use it like broadcasting. The examples I just gave, I'm not so sure about Tusk because I don't speak Polish, but um, the other three examples, they actually engage with the people on Twitter. Because it's interesting to see how many people not only are following them, but how many people they are following. Because we uh, have example, I'm, I'm based in the Netherlands, you have example of politicians that have 15,000 people who are following them, and they follow nobody. <laughs> They're not having a conversation. That's, that's precisely the point, because but, but, uh, there are just, just yeah. on the British point, there are plenty uh, of Bri the there are British politicians who are using social media, yeah? but there are very few of them who are in any way using it in an interesting and creative manner. Yeah? There's a lot of broadcast, they will engage with people who are on their side, yeah? they will never deal with critique very effectively. Yeah? 
there were in the numbers look great. Fine, yeah, I follow Phil, um, uh, Peter Altmaier. Um, uh, there are you, the ones you did cite are a couple of half counter examples. Yeah, Jan Philipp Albrecht. I work with Maritza Schacher, so I know what she's capable of. Um, but uh, but I can count on the fingers of one hand any British politicians who are using this in a really genuinely interesting and engaging manner. And a lot of it is kind of. I've, I've got and I've blogged about it. There's kind of, four, in my mind, four stages of an online politician. The first is denial. You know? The second is self-promotion. The third level is, uh, consul, is, is conversation. And the fourth level is kind of transformation, i.e. realizing that people out there know more than they do on certain issues. There are very, very few people who've got to that fourth stage. Altmaier hasn't got there. Uh, there are no other German politicians I follow. I follow like some members of the European Parliament from Germany, and I speak German so I can follow what they say, Matthias Grote, people like that. There are none who've got beyond a kind of a polite little bit of conversation kind of stage. Very few are getting anything like to what the Pirate Party is capable of doing, which is actually genuinely using the knowledge of the people on the net to really deeply inform their policy making. No one in the UK really is doing that, and there are very, very few in German or French or Dutch or Nordic politics that are outside of the Pirate Party. There are very, very few still. More questions? Yep. Uh, hi. Um, you know, you're talking a lot about creating a common European culture. You were talking about this earlier. And I'm, ugh, I'm so sick of hearing it. Sorry. sorry. Um, because I think it's so cool that we all come from different backgrounds. I think we should totally uh, embrace it. And, and, and I might sound immodest, but in difference to the US, I think we should be really happy that we all come from different backgrounds here. And my question is, define a common European culture. What is it you want to establish? Um, yeah, that's my, that's my question. I think that is a great viewpoint, honestly. It's this, <laughs> you know, there's this saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. There's, I mean, if you look at what the internet has done, it means that anybody can bring any ideas to the table, and they're valued solely on the merits of the ideas alone, and never on who brought them, never on the conditions when how that person was born, where, when, how, and never on that person's age, religion, politics, only the ideas themselves. And this brings a tremendous diversity where we are forced to release our prejudices because we can't see that when well, we cannot judge from things we don't know. We are forced to judge the ideas on their own merits in ways we've never been able to do before. So I agree with you absolutely. I celebrate this diversity every single day. And it's also that which allows us to bring this, it's called institutional competition in, in, um, in legalese, in, in, politi in political speak. When everybody's working the same way, you don't have any way of improving. You don't have any competition between processes, between bureaucratic, pro bureaucratic ways of doing things, be be between forms, between net, uh, pro all of this, all of this citizenship or citizenry, if you like. So yeah, I think it's great that, for instance, Eastern Europe is just charging ahead of Western Europe right now in terms of building broadband and just leapfrogging Western Europe with all its paperwork going straight to electronics. I think it's great to see how, there you go. I think it's great to see this being questioned on so many levels. And we wouldn't have that if we weren't diverse, if we didn't have different cultural backgrounds. If I didn't, wasn't able to come with Swedish eyes and see that things in Brussels are much more complicated than they need to be, then nobody would question that. So, absolutely, I think you're right in every detail. But I think we all yeah. know that you know things are not going too well over there. Like I don't, I don't think it's only the Swedish eyes, you well. know. Um, but I think we should instead we should just you know 
have take it for granted that we all come from different backgrounds and then just work on the relations with other, I'm coming from an international relations background. Why can't we just work on the relations of, I don't know, just the fact of accepting each other coming from different countries and then work on pro problems rather than establishing a culture. Like, why do, we, yeah. why do we need the culture? I mean, we are all Europeans and we all know it. Like, what, what I, culture is it we need? I'm personally, I'm really not arguing against any diversity in different cultural background. As Rick, I'm day, on a daily level, I'm celebrating diversity. But it's a matter of fact, actually, that Europe is not the European Union and there are lots of countries, not only outside of the European Union, but which call themselves Europe, where, where freedom of the press, where, where freedom of expression is really suppressed. And so that's not a matter of background, but that's a matter of common value. So I'm, I'm, I, I really celebrating diversity as well on a daily level. But I'm arguing, I'm arguing that there we need a common demand for democracy. And I'm really happy, as I mentioned earlier, as you, that we should be happy about having here a more or less common understanding of some crucial important values. But Europe is not the European Union and outside some countries there we have really some problems taking into account Belarus, taking into account um, Azerbaijan, uh, where we on a daily level have violations of human rights, press freedom, media freedom, freedom of expression, um, bloggers are threatened, um, journalists are sometimes arrested, killed, and I just want to point out this. Well, well I think that at at least on this side, we were not talking about culture. I think pretty much all of us uh, do agree with you that we're all happy about having you know, a cultural diversity that can be our richness. Uh, what we were, I think we were talking about is citizenship and structures or channels in which we can, uh, we can recognize our common culture and we can build a, a sort of a country or a sort of a framework in which we can all recognize each other and will be dependent by each other, not only when things are bad, but also when things are good. Because, you know, how is going now that we are taking all the bad side of it and actually not taking advantages of the strength that we could build in, in being uh, more aware that, that we are united even if we don't always remember that. Uh, so I don't think that your, your point of view, which I completely agree with, I, don't th I think is pretty much uh, in line with that and is not a contradiction uh, when we say that there are not structures to do that, there is no common political platforms around the countries and still the public sphere is uh, over influenced by traditional media which are most of the time very national, nationally focused and don't portray uh, the vision of a more international Europe or transnational Europe that we would need to understand better what's going on. So uh, if, if, if you agree, but I think that's pretty much what we were saying. Okay, uh, hi, I come from Macedonia, so I could probably relate to what you were saying, uh, Chris. And uh, also, I mean, uh, I would like to respond to the, to the previous interlocutor, or, because I, I don't see this as a matter of replacing any type of identity with another. So creating a joint European identity is something that would enclose or would provide space for national or ethnic or religious or other identities which are basically presented as opposed by forces which try, especially in Eastern Europe, by forces which try to continue the undemocratic practices. And in much of Eastern Europe, maybe even in the new member states of, of the EU, the, structure of, of the, the structures of the EU and the insistence on transparency, on solving some very cru crucial problems related to the life of the people in the country, including the journalists, like independent judiciary, uh, independent control of the police, uh, accountability, spending of the public money, eradicating corruption. Uh, they are uh, totally connected with the European integration process. In, pla in some places, if there is not the European in uh, integration process, there would be no oversight over the local uh, national governments. The, the citizens who are oppressed have nowhere else to turn. And uh, so, what, what are you looking for? Are you looking for so, 
I think, no, I, I find it crucially important for the people in the EU to look a little over the fence and see their new, mem I mean, to see what's going on in Eastern Europe in the, because sooner or later we'll become, become citizens of the EU too. And there is a, a need to maybe try to work together to solve the problems which, like in the case, uh, case of Greece, if they're put under the rug, they will surface 20 years later, or like in the case of Hungary with the fresh freedom, surfaced, yeah, like 20 years later after its democratic transition started, and they got into you like 10, 10 years ago. And now we are faced with um, what, you, uh, what, what you can call presidents that an EU country imposes laws which are counter of the European values, which are the, at the core of these democratic processes. So, and this can spread because this precedent can be used elsewhere, like, and the things that happen in the West have big reflection elsewhere because if they can happen here, then it's much more easier for the people who are against democratic values to present them as normal and use them as excuse in their countries to show that what happens to the people there is nothing, nothing wrong. Do you have a question to the panel? Oh, okay. Just an opinion. Just a thought. Okay. okay. Maybe a question to Rick and, and John. Um, I recently bet with someone on the, on the internet that if the Pirate Party will manage to get up a common topical platform for the 2014 EU elections, and if the socialists and the center right get a, get European Commission candidates to run um, for the elections, we will get a European public which will pay attention both to topics and to persons for the first time. Um, would you take that bet with me too? Well, speaking for the European Pirate Parties, that is in progress. We are going to make a, uh, a joint effort in, in the election bid for the 2014 across the European Pirate Parties. As, as for, can, can you speak for the social, Socialist International, John? I can't speak for Socialist International. Um, I can kind of fill in what happens um, with regard to the Party of European Socialists. Um, there is the idea that the Party of European Socialists should decide a common candidate for Commission President for two, prior to 2014. The decision-making process is each of the national parties of the Party of European Socialists shall decide how they shall nominate someone. That can be an open process or it can be a kind of a co closed, behind closed doors kind of traditional sort of process. I do think that the Party of European Socialists will get its act together a bit better this time simply because they've got nothing to lose and they looked stupid last time when they didn't manage to agree on some kind of candidate. If the left does it, the right will probably have to do so too, and there are already rumours circulating in Brussels about the right trying to unify behind a particular candidate um, who's currently the Luxembourg member of the European Commission. Um, uh, so I do think that, yeah, on that thing, we should have two, two or potentially three, if the Liberals put forward one, some, some, some faces at the European elections. Whether those individuals are actually bold enough to talk about anything substantive is another issue. Um, uh, the left would have to manage to carve out some kind of notional policy, which is at odds with the policies of the centre-right at European level. And they've equally been rather reluctant to have that sort of policy input as well in the past. But maybe if you've got a candidate first, and maybe that person can kind of corral the forces on the left. So we'll have some incremental improvement, I think. So it sounds at least that, like you're getting your wish that there will be common topics across Europe, there will be common people across Europe. And let's hope then that that does cause the push across Europe to actually talk across country borders for it, the European be elections that you, that you aim for. It'll be topically driven rather than the fact that we happen to be European citizens. Well, we have something close to a European president, or at least Politburo chairman, right. uh, that's, that's being person-driven, and that's going to be the interest of all of Europe. So you, I think you can have both. OK. Question from the audience? Um, Nina Klein from the Frankfurt Book Fair. I have a question of how important you think that um, subsidizing and finance is for creating this public sphere. Two of you mentioned volunteer translators. Um, I know the financing of Eurotopics 
a bit um, just how important is it that the EU spends money on this? Because it spends a lot of money at the moment on, on translating uh, documents. So couldn't it help to, um, uh, in the volunteer sphere, what I am? Okay, they should, in other words, you should be able to build a career. Yep. So my experience is that people will translate things they feel worthwhile translating, and there's no shortage of that. So I haven't even asked for translators for, for my blog, which I will do shortly once I've had enough experience with them. And still, upwards of a dozen people have contacted me saying, I want to translate this into my language. Can, can I please do that? Let me think about it for a minute. Yes, you can. Please do that. So it's very easy to think in terms of what resources are needed, but I'd prefer to turn the problem around and ask, how can we help these people who already, who already want to do this and who are spending their spare time building this European identity through sharing of ideas? And there might be a political way to do that, the most the easiest way might be to keep the net free, rather than the classical political solution of allocating a bit of budget and saying that this, this is a proper solution. Well, I personally don't think that um, we have a budget problem. Uh, I think what the EU should do is what John said, for example, or, or Rick said, about creating um, parties and platforms during the elections that make people uh, participate and, and are actually relevant to people across the borders. So choosing a candidate which can be representative of everybody, can speak with every, for, every, for, for everybody across different countries, uh, have public consultations on the net about the EU policies, uh, be more open and answering questions and tweets and blogs and posts that all we can make through organized blogs or personally. I think this is what I expect from the European Union, rather than budget to create new blogs. We all know that people who want to have a blog does it and, and is not waiting for uh, resources from, uh, 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 from, from the Brussels bureaucracy. But, but from a journalist's point of view, who will, who will keep account, who will take account of uh, what local politicians are saying? Who will check what po politicians are saying? Well, they should. I mean, what I expect from members of the European Parliament and European commissioners and people that work in Brussels is that they take into account what people, what the citizens that vote for them or should have voted for them if we had a better system, think and write and exchange with each other. So this is what I expect. I mean, it's, it's, it, they don't have to allocate a budget to take into account what the citizens of this continent think. I, I fully agree on this, and I think what it's the European Union and the discourse in the European Union so far, it's totally irrelevant to lots of people because it's intransparent and it's not a really civil societal approach of the whole project. And I think one of the biggest problems of you is that it's intransparent, and because of that, it appears totally irrelevant. And that's very important just to mention that there exist some projects, but they are civil society project like Ask the EU, where civil society organizations are trying to promote transparency. But I don't think that it's a matter of money, more money um, invested by the EU into lots of projects. And I don't even believe that, that, that in the end, su such elitist project, Eurotopics, which I was responsible for, need so many languages. In the end, a project like Eurotopics, which I, would, which I was working for, just is, in my self, I think, a kind of um, network where national networks have to be connected to. And, um, and then it has to be translated, interpreted into local languages. To give a very concrete proposal to what the European Union can do to help this happen is stop talking about net freedom in terms of foreign policy. Stop yeah. talking about it as foreign policy. It is not credible. Start talking about net freedom as domestic policy first. 
once you have net freedom as domestic policy, can you be credible in talking about it as foreign policy? But not until then. Data retention directive is an abomination. The wiretapping laws in many countries are horrible to this kind of transparency. We need whistleblower laws. We need whistleblower protection. We need freedom of the press that's guaranteed across European constitutions that applies equally offline and online. Get that as a domestic policy and we'll see polit political transparency. And then you can start talking about it in terms of foreign policy. The same could be said for all EU policy as an extension of domestic policy. Yeah. Question for me, Hi. Save the budget for social security. <laughs> I'm interested in the uh, third question you raised. How can we help building Europe through the net? I think we've heard from John about the blogging portal. You mentioned online consultations. Any innovative ideas, tech projects that uh, you think could help yeah, building Europe through the net? Well, I think there are several aspects. One is talking again about the EU and talking about what I mentioned earlier, making the EU transparent. But talking again not about the EU, talking from our current work, I think there the net is really a fantastic instrument for, be, for, for, for living solidarity with people outside the EU in countries like, like Azerbaijan, like Belarus, organizing solidarity protest projects. So I always want to stress the difference between uh, that, that, that Europe is more than the EU. So for me, it's an instrument of solidarity for, for people oppressed in outside uh, countries outside of the EU. But of course, as well an instrument for making the EU more transparent as Ask the EU, which is really a fantastic project if you don't know it yet. And, and in terms of uh, practical projects... Uh, yeah, Ask the EU is a very yeah, concrete yeah. project. Yeah, uh, also look at, uh, have you seen the Wikidata project that's going on? Where they're, 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 uh, because if you go to Wikipedia, you will see it's very different, it has a very different structure depending on which language you're accessing it. So what they're, what they're doing uh, over a project of a year, from what I understand, is, is making sure that the, uh, uh, the material that's done in Swedish, for instance, is also accessible in, in other languages, partly through automation, but uh, that's at least a step forward uh, so that there are more conversations going across uh, um, country barriers. But uh, you're... you're there's another one I'd like to highlight as well, um, which is votewatch.eu, which is essentially the EU-level equivalent of they work for you in the UK, so ah. basically how members of the European Parliament behaved. Problem is there's a lot more work that still needs to be done in that regard. There was also a vote uh, last week when they wanted to have greater openness of the votes in committees in the European Parliament, which was actually voted down in the, uh, the Constitutional Affairs Committee. Um, so we need to manage to up the pressure on individual MEPs with regard to openness of the votes in the, uh, in the European Parliament. Parliament. And also an issue which was touched on by Helen Derbyshire in her presentation yesterday, which is the openness of the Council, which is even more of a severe problem than openness in the, in the, the European Parliament. So um, those are things we've got to look at. And with the people who run VoteWatch.eu are very determined, very committed, and they need all the support they can get to try to manage to push a, a more kind of political advocacy line for openness as well as actually the, the, particular, the particular software tool. To, but, to, but to go back to the, the previous point, uh, do they need money to, or at least core uh, funding? They've got some foundation. They probably would do. They've got some foundation funding um, uh, for the work that they're doing. I haven't spoken to them recently about what their current plans are, I'm afraid. So I don't know the answer in detail, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. Um, so additionally to the question, I would like to have some projects that are not existing yet, so ideas um, that we could invent, we as bloggers, we as activists, we as organizations that are promoting, for example, net freedoms and other uh, European um, common topics. So maybe you have ideas on that, that too. And then there is another question here. Well, uh, I mean, I think, uh, the what we should do uh, is um, as 
basically what you said in the title of the track. Uh, if we work more united and if we sort of join our strengths together, uh, I mean, for example, John is doing an excellent job with uh, EU blogging because he, he, he he, he sort of concentrates the knowledge together. And, and so in one access point, you have access to a lot of different vision that uh, you know, portray what's happening. Now, if more people like John would do that and more people would participate and, 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 and understand that what's happening in their country needs to be known in the other countries of Europe, then we, we, you know, we can make this transition shorter rather than longer. So uh, I don't think there is the, the brilliant new idea, like, uh, you know, we're not here to discover hot water, uh, as we would say, but uh, the, it, it's, it's more a matter of uh, being aware that what happens, as I said before, it's also has to do with us and, and this, the, you know, how much we believe that it's something we should do or not. Also, building on that, um, I kind of ask myself a simple question when dealing with European Union matters is, whatever this problem I'm confronted with, how can I solve it online? Like, that's just the starting question for anything. Right, I want to hit Silvio Berlusconi, who's turning up at a European Union summit. Right, okay, let's deluge a Twitter wall with anti-Silvio Berlusconi tweets and manage to get the experiment ended. I want to do something about gender balance in the European Commission, which no one is talking about. Right, let's put together a network in order to manage to deal with that. So, what we've got to have is more people who care about European Union politics and are just simply willing to say, right, this annoys me. How am I going to build some kind of a project in order to manage to solve that particular issue? And you will find common ground with people who can build networks of bloggers, networks on Twitter, uh, online petitions, take your pick. Um, it's also vitally important as well, is when you've identified a good person within the system, you know, is to work very closely with those individuals. There are good ones right across the EU institutions. There are some good MEPs. There are some good ministers in the council. There are plenty of good officials in the commission, but at the lower levels. Yeah? Build those networks, meet them for a beer, work out the ways and means that you can help them and they can help you. Because, you know? for example, good communications I have with some officials from the European Commission mean that sometimes I get emailed a bit of edgy stuff to work with that the Commission itself can't do anything with. You know? Now, that's not one Sounds like leaking. Uh, essentially, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's more kind of... Well, um, Felix. These are the sorts of things that we like people to be, to be looking at. And then, importantly, the biggest tool we've got is the European Parliament elections for 2014 at European Union level. So, make demands of political parties, make demands of candidates. You know? um, take, for example, the ACTA protest. David Martin is the rapporteur in the European Parliament um, uh, for ACTA. He says he's receiving 500 emails a day about ACTA at the moment. How many of those are actually getting replies? Yeah. Can we do some naming and shaming of politicians who never actually at European level ever bother replying to those citizen, that citizen critique, for example? Yeah? Uh, some of those sorts of things, because the, all of Brussels builds up to a kind of, you might not see it outside of the Brussels circles, but in Brussels anyway, all of Brussels builds up to a kind of crescendo to each European Parliament election every five years. And that process, that kind of lead up period is already starting now. So if you can get any European Parliament hook on anything that you're doing, yeah, that's your way of managing to kind of leverage something in the Brussels circles. And also because the new European Commission is appointed uh, just after the European Parliament elections, you can tie those two things together as well. Yeah? So don't like the German member of the European Commission, for example, make sure he doesn't get nominated for a second term. That's one that's ripe for a bit of web campaigning, for example. And, and don't forget the impact of uh, maps. If you, if you see how people are using maps and infographics uh, to get information across, f first of all, that, that gets across a lot of language barriers. It puts information in, in, into uh, complex information in, into uh, an easy to understand context. And if you look at the uh, equivalent of uh, Fix My Street, right? Uh, Im imagine if that was also um, uh, on, on a European level, yeah. Not that. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I give the microphone to you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, just. Oh. Uh, 
John just mentions the, uh, that we have uh, to do something as, as bloggers and to, to build up a infrastructure for, uh, yeah, for, for um, talking about the European idea and uh, to go on. And um, I just think about the, um, what, what's the uh, key of, of the normal national press for example, because um, the press is influencing all the people, the, the, all, uh, the single national people, and they also uh, make some campaigns um, from one country against uh, other countries, for example, uh, the German campaign against the um, Greece people, because uh, sometimes uh, it was said that they, are, uh, they don't do anything or uh, don't work or uh, very incredible things. And um, so I, I just think uh, perhaps we need um, an European... Um, Are you thinking about a platform? Uh, no, not a platform, but uh, rules for the European press not to uh, harm the European uh, idea and uh, not, not, not to... to, this, uh, to, to, to the, um, yeah, to, to act... Um, for, for one country against one other country, European countries. Well, there's, each there's other. certainly laws about hate speech, but I mean. Uh... <laughs> well, can, can I see, uh, say something? I see the point, but yeah. uh, coming from a country where each city fights each other on a daily basis, uh, you can survive that. I mean, people is enough smart to know that, um, you know. Press is the press, and you know yeah. we all have our opinions. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you know it's not just because a newspaper says that the Greeks are lazy that everybody starts thinking that. Uh, besides, you know we all have cheap flights now, and we can go there and see for ourselves. Uh, but I, I, I what, what I take from your point of view is that uh, perhaps and. And that's what, what I was trying to say earlier uh, at the beginning of this panel, is that we have to uh, build ourselves this sense of community, which is also uh, what will uh, build up our immune system to fight each other uh, when you know, press campaigns or media campaigns go on. And, and we can only do it if we, if we share information uh, each other. And, and you know, if if you have resisted that sort of campaign, it's probably because at the same time, through the web, through friends, through traveling, you have seen Greek people, you've seen the situation, you've sp spoken with somebody, and you knew that you know the portrait was a bit biased, and you know, and and you know, truth was probably more complex than that. So that's you know the only medicine we have is to build our immune system, getting to know each other better. And, and I think the web can help doing that. Uh, and make sure that you, you also have the same amount of influence that the uh, mainstream media have. But as, as you pointed out, in some countries that, that's equal, if, if not stronger. Yeah. I just want really to oppose to this idea. I, I don't want a Europe like that. It sounds like a really nice Brussels bureaucrats idea. Some, uh, some press rules. I really don't want such a Europe because that's actually the, the, the good thing about Europe that we have the diversity. And coming back to the, my first point in the discussion, that's actually the point. We need a culture, a demand culture for, 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 for media freedom, for press freedom and political culture. But the problem is that in several countries of the EU and outside of the EU, I repeat myself, sorry, but uh, we, there are negative experiences with democracy and with the EU, and we have to build up from the bottom positive experience, and we don't need a bureaucrat's idea of some common rules because we have some values on Europe, and we have to experience, we have to make this as a common experience, but not some common European rules on, on this. Yeah, but that's, that's very German. I, I just want to add that, that we have these uh, press rules securely on national basis, so um, why don't to, to overcome them? No, we don't. Actually, 
actually we don't. We, we have some very progressive talking about Greece and talking about Germany. We have some pr very progressive media laws in whole Eastern Europe. The, most of the Eastern media laws and constitution are much more progressive than Western countries. We can learn a lot in theory, I say, for, from Eastern countries regarding the constitution. Isn't there a problem in Hungary though at the moment? <laughs> Well, there's a problem, of course, there's a problem, and it will get much worse probably from July on when the, when the new media law um, will get into effect so some crucial rules. It's in, effect, it's in effect, but there will be some crucial rules which will be in effect from July on. Yeah, there is, of course. Okay, a couple more questions. Yeah. I'd like to know... Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, I'd like to you know, uh, how do you think does the crisis affect our chances to build up a European public sphere? Because on one side, we've seen more and more negative emotions coming up towards certain countries or towards the EU as such. Um, but on the other hand, I heard that the crisis even uh, provoked blogs to come up. So, um, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, I would, I think there is a, different perception in southern Europe and in northern Europe. I would say in the, the, the southern discourses on Europe due to the crisis got more Europeanized, I would say, if I observe or I observed at Eurotopics uh, media debates. But I would say in northern Europe, talking about very superficial, but probably you could say it from your Swedish perspective as well, but as far as I see in the northern sphere and comparing to the southern sphere, the northern media blogosphere discourses weren't affected so much from the crisis as there weren't so, 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 so big changes. But in Southern Europe, there, the media debates really changed. Um, I think, taking it in a slightly different angle on that, um, I think the crisis has shown how interdependent we are. And it's also shown that trying to solve those problems of the Eurozone is struck principally among the leaders of Europe's member states at the moment, and it's not actually solved necessarily directly at European level. Now, if you look at what's happened in every sub step in European integration over the years, is what you have, first of all, is some problem which gets solved with some kind of technocratic solution, and thereafter comes the accountability. So at the moment, we might be in that stage where everyone looks like they're fighting each other, but if the whole lot holds together, and I do believe the Eurozone will hold together and Greece will stay within it, simply because the economic scenarios of Greece leaving the Eurozone are that catastrophic for everyone, that that will, keep, that will focus everyone's minds. Um, we, w we should reach a stage in perhaps five years from now where, we've, where we have passed the worst of the economic problems and therefore we can look at the politics and the accountability again. And as a result of that, that should be the stage at which we can then actually look to those issues and of, of improving our discourse on our democratic accountability at European Union level. So I see it as a negative kind of, it looks like things are falling apart, it looks like there's a highly critical situation at the moment. But I do think that if you look at those similar sorts of things which have happened in the past, that should be a kind of a passing phase and it should be, it should be improving in years to come. There's also, of course, Rick and, and the Pirate Party, which is a positive thing in my mind, while at the same time also the, the rise of far-right movements, who also tend to succeed at times of economic difficulties. Again, if our economies grow once more, you should see a decline once more of those far-right movements, um, although judging by the success of Le Pen over the years in France, those, those right-wing populist movements are probably here to stay at some level, uh, but perhaps not quite the level they're at at the moment. I'd like to add to that, that I think it's a bit more complicated than just is this crisis divisive or does it join us more together? I think it, I think it does foster some sort of disillusionment perhaps with the leadership in uh, Europe overall as in why we knew this would happen why did you bring us into this mess you can hear that voice pretty much all over Europe apart from that I agree with Christian that there's a quite quite a big difference here between northern Europe and southern Europe in terms of how much is this crisis on everybody's mind but what what I do see now and that I didn't see before is a sense of solidarity between the common people of Europe, as in, look what the political leaders 10 years ago caused to all of us. So I'd argue that the divisive effect is more be between the average citizens and the political leaders that just pursued their pet project, no, no holds barred, than between the countries and cultures as such, because they, they are all in the same boat after all. 
Well, I, I, I quite agree, and, and I really think, um, although it might sound, uh, it might sound um, provocative, that actually this crisis, it, it might be an opportunity. I think it might be an opportunity because, well, I believe that because uh, the crash of the Eurozone at the moment would probably be a real catastrophe, I, I would, I would um, definitely agree with John that it's not gonna happen, but it's gonna be hard. Uh, and, and, and people will, will keep on posing questions and, and probably, uh, we have not even got as, as, as bad as it can go, uh, not yet. But uh, all of that uh, will really cause accountability afterwards and, uh, and also will, will result in the fact that we will have to build a, a political consensus and a political union after the economic union, which was probably the, best mis the, the worst mistake we have done. I mean, the, the worst mistake that has happened is at least in my opinion, was to make a monetary union without any political union whatsoever because the national states are still much more influential in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the economic policy uh, than, than the uh, Commission or the European Parliament. So when, when all the, to go all, through all this, at some stage, we will have to build a political union. The next parliament elect, the next European election will probably be very crucial on that. And still now, uh, I was talking with them before at lunch. Uh, if, if some of you have seen the debate in France yesterday, uh, even though we're, you know, it's national election, half of the debate was about Europe. Uh, and none of the candidates were saying we are pulling out or we are pulling out of the euro. We are, we, they were proposing two different ideas of the European Union. Now, this is not the stage to debate which, you know, which one we prefer. That, that's not the point. The point is that, in two, that five years ago, it wasn't like that. Five years ago, the national elections in France would have been about an idea for France, not an idea of Europe. Now. It's mostly about an idea, how do we want Europe, how do we want France in Europe? But you know, th there's no question that the main point is what sort of Europe we envisage in five years' time. Uh, in Italy, it's more or less is what's happening. Uh, well, Britain is not like that, but, but we, we all know the British. You know, they, they, they don't, but, but, but the crisis has caused that because it's proved that we are all very dependent on each other, even from a very small country like Greece, which is rather a small country with probably 10 million people and a very small economy. But, you know, German banks and French banks and Italian banks are like packed with with Greek bonds, so whatever happens there is gonna affect us, so that's the reality. Uh, we are phrasing it quite dramatically and probably none of us would have, would have wanted to do that, but uh, this, this big crisis can only represent a new opportunity because there's no way out rather than go forward. Okay, that's clear. Uh, we have time for one more question. Okay, I shall leave over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Dietmar Eidolf. I'm just a citizen. Um, I think we should stop talking about bloggers as opposed to the European institutions. I think both are aspects of the same direction. Uh, bloggers tend to be part of the informed expert public who offer a back channel. And I fully agree with Alessandra. I think we need to institutionalize back channels to bring it into some constitutional European um, uh, framework that allows to, to build Europe with, with the inclusion of an informed public. And my question is, are there any, any um, initiatives on the European level that are not government, government funded to, to really implement these institutional changes? I hear not. Silence but you think it's a good panel. idea. But, it's a comment. But, you, but you think it's a good idea. Uh, 
Is it a bit like uh, what, what uh, they work for you are doing? Well, you need you need some you need subject. some of those you need some of those sorts of things. I, 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 I tend to see the problem the other way round, essentially, which is that uh, if the if the political structures are right, uh, decent communications can come from that. Not we need to find our ways and means of communicating in order to manage to improve our political structures. You know? um, so what are the sorts of things we could theoretically build? Right? Okay, well, we've got Vote Watch, which does a decent job but could be improved, but the main improvement that's needed is better structural openness of the EU institutions. We don't need a better Vote Watch. We need a better institution that Vote Watch watches. You know? Right. Um, uh, that's we, we need some slight. We need to have some better openness of the council. But again, we're not lacking the kind of the web and the communications tools in that regard. And certainly, I also view it. Now, this is a, a kind of a delicate issue. I'm, I've never worked as a journalist. I come into blogging as someone who's done the EU work for years and had views about it. So I'm kind of part campaigner, part writer. But I'm not trying to purely report on what's happening. Yeah? I'm kind of part of some kind of discussion. I've got a page on my blog that says, should you trust this blog? Which basically says, this is the stuff I've worked on, so I should know something about it. So maybe you might be able to trust me. Yeah? Um, so I don't know how the hell you kind of make some kind of channel for institutionalizing that. And if anyone did try to kind of institutionalize that, that would kill off maybe some of the stuff that works on the blog. Yeah? Um, it's also part of the reason why I, apart from on two pages, which are about stuff which is not directly relevant to the, to, one is about coffee, actually, on my blog. I have advertising on two pages which are buried on my blog, but on the home page and everything about European Union politics, there is no advertising. It's basically saying, here I am, this is my view on European Union politics, take it or leave it. Yeah? And I don't get funded by the European Union in order to do it. In fact, I don't get funded by anyone to do it. So therefore, it's completely straightforward and transparent. Now, if I'm in any way kind of institutionalized in that process, yeah, I maybe lose the whole point of what I was doing in the first place. And that's what kind of makes me a little bit nervous. You're no longer authentic. Well, can, can I on, only add something? Because uh, this is true, but uh, in order for the institution to be more open, I also think they should actually open up, which means one thing are blogs and independent forum, independent vote watch, which is fine and cannot be institutionalized, wouldn't make sense, I agree. But another thing is the, the European par members of parliaments or the European Commission especially, which is not voted, should be more open in accepting comments from the public opinion, even if they're not blogs. I mean, I don't expect the European commissioner, I don't know, I don't expect Nelly Cruz to watch or read every single blog in the European countries every day, because that wouldn't make sense and probably wouldn't be possible. But I would want her, and she does, she's actually one of the few that does it, to make public consultation on yeah. important and crucial issues in which every citizen can you know, post their opinion, or parties, or association, or grassroots organizations. Uh, some commissioners do, uh, some commissioners don't. In the most crucial areas of the European Union politics, such as the economy, as usual, this is not done, or, or is done in a very slight and flexible way, which is not really satisfactory. Uh, I'm not sure whether institutionalizing it is, is the good way. Uh, I wouldn't have a clue how to do it. Perhaps Rick would know better being there. Uh, but uh, I think it's something we need in order to, to build a public sphere. And if it's not done you know, spontaneously by the institutions, perhaps uh, we should do it in, in, a, in a way, you know, start posting messages to them, start sending emails as it was done with ACTA, and you know, they, will, they will eventually listen. Rick, some closing remarks? Yeah, I, I think there's an important distinction to be made here between a, a regulated institution and something that evolves organically and spontaneously. I mean, we already have an institution of European bloggers that alert activists and the public to what's going on in the European Union. But as I interpret the question is, should we regulate some sort of institution like that? And that's when I become a little bit un unnerved, if that's the right word, as blogging is essentially the press, but it's also speech. 
It's me speaking to whomever's interested. The internet is the press. It is speech, and it is assembly. And frankly, you can't regulate that without hurting it, and hurting it a lot. Mm. So if you're building some, if you're building some sort of institution, I think you need to recognize that if in every attempt to regulate this will also be an attempt to regulate speech and regulate the free press. So I would much rather have European, uh, European existing institutions offer data, offer transparency, offer interesting topics to write about than having the same institutions trying to regulate how we can write about them. Christian, closing yeah. remark. I think Rick nearly said the same what I wanted to say. I just, I'm skeptical about any new regulations because we have some regulations which aren't applied. Oh, and so I don't have to add anything because Rick said what I wanted to say. Okay, and on that, thank you very much for attending this session. <laughs> um,